It was 60 years ago that a group of explorers made their first tentative steps into the unknown. willingly risking their lives to be the first to reach the roof of the world. Since then, more than 4,000 have made it to the summit of Everest. Still, with every success, there are those who fail. Driven, some say, by blind ambition. Summit fever is, uh, is a very real thing. Death is very near. Yeah, that's the feeling. And uh, you can be next. I can be next. Unprecedented competition to reach the top is leading to high altitude tensions, raising questions over who is ensuring the well-being of those on the mountain. I think the ministry has very little inclination to deal with safety here. I'm Steve Chow. On this edition of 101 East, we're hiking through the Himalayas to Everest to examine if the darker side of humanity is overshadowing one of humankind's greatest achievements. High up in the Himalayas, hidden among other towering peaks, is Everest. Those living below its dark slopes have known for centuries that no other mountain on Earth rivals it. Revered in monasteries throughout Nepal, Tibetans call Everest Chomolungma, the mother goddess of the world. Yeah, I love this photo, man. This is, uh, to get a deeper night. understanding of Everest, we go to see Tashi Tenzin. Historically and emotionally, it's very important to me because it's where my family history comes. It's the north face of Everest. and uh, it's where His grandfather, Tenzing Norgay, and climbing partner Edmund Hillary were the first to climb the world's tallest peak. And while both he and his father have followed in their footsteps with numerous summits of their own, Tashi Tenzing says it's never been the same. The 1953, or 60 years, I would call that the last innocent climb of Everest. I think it was one of the most beautiful. And every step was a journey with, with the prayers and the good luck of the world. Last 35 miles from Kathmandu, capital of Nepal, Hillary and Ten Singh were welcomed and congratulated by their fellow members of the expedition. On May 29, 1953, Tenzing, a humble Sherpa, and Hillary, a humble beekeeper from New Zealand, came down from the summit to massive celebrations around the world. Accomplishing something no one had ever before, it would have been easy to boast. Instead, some of their first words were of respect for each other. Tenzing and I have been climbing together a good deal, and I think we've become a fairly uh, happy pair. And this was just one example of how a pair wrote together our unit, and how one is always protecting the other. Tashi Tenzing was last on Everest in 2007. Even then, he says, the camaraderie between climbers was changing, becoming more about big business, with safety secondary to profit. That, he says, is costing lives. You know, you have overcrowded people on the summit of Everest. You have decisions that the leaders make which are not all the time, you know, 100% the right decision. Our journey to learn more begins with an airlift from Nepal's capital of Kathmandu. With no roads leading to the remote region, it is the starting point for all expeditions. Just going to Everest has its own perils. We're heading to an airport considered the most dangerous in the world. In a recent major plane crash, all 18 on board were killed. Unpredictable winds and sudden storms have been known to turn a beautiful day into a disaster. Modern and powerful helicopters have made it somewhat safer. 
And in less than an hour, the Lukla airstrip comes into view. We land beside the wreck of an old plane. Along the trail, it's evident the first Everest explorers placed community over fame and profit. The village of Kumjung was once one of the poorest. Today, its school is one of the most sought after in the country. Funded by a foundation Hillary started, children here get a level of education and discipline that gives them the chance to study in universities outside Nepal. Hi there. Hello, class. Hello. And when asked, who here can tell me who Edmund Hillary is? Students are more eager to talk about Hillary's generosity than his mountaineering achievements. He was a good guy. You always wanted to help the human being. He wanted to see them educated and well lived. As we climb higher, I wonder how much of that spirit remains on Everest. At 4,830 meters above sea level, we come to the Dukla Pass. Memorials to those who died scaling the world's tallest peak can be found scattered along the ridge. There are the names familiar to the mountaineering world. And then there are others who serve as a warning to the overly ambitious. Shreya Shah Chlorfine, May 19th, 2012. On that day, the 33-year-old Nepalese Canadian completed her lifelong dream of summiting Everest. She told her family she believed it would vault her from being the owner of a struggling business to becoming a motivational speaker. Eight hours later, she was dead. The Canadian flag draped over her lifeless body, just 300 meters from the top. In Toronto, Bruce Chlorfine is surrounded by memories of the life he'd shared with his wife. A jazz musician, the two met aboard a cruise ship in 2000. They married two years later. He says he asked her many times to give up her pursuit of Everest, but she was determined. If I knew then what I knew now, then I could have definitely spoken to her in a more forceful way to say, no, this is wrong for, for you to go on now. What Bruce didn't know is how underprepared she was and how many operators would have refused to take her. For two years, Sharia had spent hours a day running and training, but she had never climbed a major mountain. Her own footage shows her first faltering steps on Everest. She had to be taught how to put on crampons to cross the snow and glacier ice. You to this, huh? And then when you, you I, I showed you, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So. And more importantly, how to navigate the dangerous crevasses. <laughs> right. You good? <laughs> you did it. You did this, huh? Mountaineering experts say no expedition should accept someone so green. Like this. If people don't have any experience, they shouldn't be coming to Everest as the first mountain. This is not the place to learn to climb mountains. How that came to be is a question we asked of the agency Sharia hired. Hi, Rishi. Hello. Namaste. Namaste. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You have some video to show us, I think? Yeah. Rishi Raj Kando, the general manager of Utmost Trekking, was a family friend of Sharia's. Her mistake, he says, was that she climbed too slowly. He shows us pictures of the traffic jam she helped create near the top. Ten others would die that season, the result of those weights and bad weather, making it one of the worst periods in Everest history. She have two guides, so they told me, they tried to convince her, let's go back. And uh, she told them, very near now, I want to go up. From Camp 4, she took 19 hours to get to the summit. Most take half as long. When she collapsed from exhaustion on the way down, she'd been climbing non-stop a total of 27 hours. Likely out of oxygen, she had spent far too much time at the top. Do you blame yourself as the base camp manager? The one in charge? Yeah, but so, you know, I try to provide everything very good organized. So, how to, I'm, 
I cannot say if I if my side anything wrong, um, but nothing wrong, you know. I do my best. Uh, she didn't listen. That's the most problem, you know. If she listened to our guide, I think not that's happened. For the expedition, Candle charged Sharia $72,000, far more than some of the higher end and more seasoned operators on Everest. But the most startling fact comes from the record keeper of Nepal mountaineering. 89 year old Elizabeth Hawley has documented the goings on on Everest for more than half a century. She says up until Sharia's death, she had never heard of Atmost. They'd never been at anything. I mean, this was the first expedition they'd ever had. They were not Sherpas, they were not experienced climbers they were running this trekking agency. Would you say Atmost trekking? was qualified and had the experts to get her to the top safely. So, we, I already told you about uh, what's happened there, so what is our guide told us. Experienced mountaineers will tell you responsibility for one's own safety falls on yourself. But for the majority on Everest in the 21st century, climbing means relying on experienced guides. Over the days we spend gaining altitude, struggling to acclimatize to the thinner air, we understand more acutely how choosing those to trust can be the decision between life or death. Well, it's been 10 long days, but we can now say that base camp is now within view, 5,300 meters plus above sea level. What is incredible is that Everest climbers not only have to get here, they then have to make their way three kilometers up the Kumbu Icefall to the top. From a distance, base camp looks like a sprawling nylon city an entire industry built on the back of Everest. You can't stop people from coming. Everyone has a, you know, a dream of their own. Everest veteran Singapore's Ku Sui Chow has summited three times. He says the camp has mushroomed in size since he first came here in 1998. Back then, I think it's half or less than half this size. More than 500 people are making a bid for the top this year led by dozens of expedition companies. From base camp, climbers need to navigate through the Kumbu Icefall, where avalanches and deep crevasses can send people to their death. At 5,920 meters is Camp 1. Here there are the challenges of deep snow and unpredictable whiteouts. At 6,400 meters is Camp 2. This is the last place climbers can get a hot meal prepared by a cook. At 7,200 meters, Camp 3 appears. Carved literally out of the steep Lotse wall, more than a few climbers have fallen to their death just outside their tents. Camp 4 is found above 8,000 meters in the death zone. Up here, oxygen levels are 60% less than at sea level, and one's body is literally dying. And finally, at 8,848 meters, is the summit. Ku has also documented the traffic that creates dangerous delays, delays that prematurely saps the climber's energy. What worries him further, he says, are the growing numbers of less experienced adventure seekers, people, he says, who increasingly rely on their fleet of foot Sherpas. Sherpa's gonna pass me. If the weather turns, especially in the death zone, Ku says, even Sherpas won't be able to save those in trouble. Yeah, I think with uh, more crowd, you know, more um, newcomers, so to speak, uh, we're going to see more of that, unfortunately. And more deaths? Yes, unfortunately. Expedition groups have set additional routes this year, trying to better space people out on the mountain. But that hasn't avoided tensions from breaking out. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it might be too late to salvage things. The first warnings of a high altitude confrontation comes to base camp via the radio. Okay, okay, because I just said the bad words. 
I was angry why they were pissed off. An Italian climber has just called a number of Sherpas slaves. Yep, I copy that. I know what word he used and uh, I don't like that word either. The Sherpas had been setting ropes for this year's ascent when the Italian knocked ice on them while passing them by, leading to a shouting match. At Camp 2, 6,400 meters up, you can hear the desperate cries of other climbers. An angry mob of Sherpas is filmed gathering outside the Italian climber's tent. Rocks are thrown. A knife is drawn. He and two other Europeans are reportedly cut, but suffer only superficial wounds. No violence, please. But as quickly as it starts, the fight ends. In the days following, the climbing community closes in, and few are willing to speak about what happened. Underlying the fight are long-held tensions between two camps. On one side are Sherpas who are central to commercial expeditions, and on the other, mountaineering purists who resent the operators for the growing number of adventure seekers they bring. I would say for a pure mountaineer, Everest is too crowded. You know, uh, you may have to choose a different mountain. Yeah, Everest is really commercialized. With the few good weather windows approaching, and with so much time and money invested here, the dispute needs quick resolution. We've slowly been able to piece together what happened in the days following the fight. According to people on the base here who've asked to remain anonymous, because of the bad international press this fight was garnering, a meeting was called where after heated debate, both sides agreed that everyone had a degree of fault here. They negotiated what's now been called the Everest Peace Deal, where everyone agreed to no longer talk about the fight and move on with the business on the mountain. Up here is Nupsi which is a new, new venture this year. Russell Bryce has led expeditions on Everest for more than 20 years and also summited twice himself. One of the key problems, he says, is the absence of Nepalese authorities when it comes to ensuring safety, whether during disputes or other emergencies. I think the ministry has very little inclination to deal with safety here. They don't understand it. Um, if it involves getting money, they might do something. Nepal earns close to $12 million a year from climbing expeditions on Everest, a hefty sum for an impoverished country. Despite this, it's still up to group leaders to protect their teams and pay for their own rescues when necessary. When the warm weather last year dramatically increased the danger of falling ice and snow, Russell pulled his entire team. And while conditions this year are better, some of his members only narrowly avoided death. You have a good luck. We put the question of safety to Nepal's tourism minister. He argues money from permits does go to improving conditions for climbing, but when pressed, provided no specific examples. Everything is going in the right direction and government is trying to make the best way to make the Mount Everest uh, climbing, the mountaineering more safer. Uh, it's it's minus 20 degree. Independently, Russell Bryce spends tens of thousands of dollars to get the most accurate weather reports. And while his clients pay well for his services, they are fed by a chef who once cooked for Queen Elizabeth. In one of the harshest environments in the world, they can also lounge in the Tiger Dome, which offers entertainment with a view. More importantly, while Nepal imposes no limits on who can climb, Bryce only takes on clients with proven experience. And the main thing is to stay uh, healthy. And the biggest rule in his camp is safety comes first. Bryce is the boss, and when he says turn around, everyone must listen. We have pulled people back from summit day. Some of them have gone home angry. Some people have come back a week later and gone to the summit. Um, people say that I'm quite tough, and yes, I am, because this is tough here. So uh, this is not an easy jaunt down to the supermarket. The one thing Bryce stands on is his record. He's never lost a customer yet. I'm here to look after their safety. It's no use 
just taking their money and sending everyone home in a body bag. That doesn't work. Over the years, Everest has lured all kinds of climbers. What troubles Bryce is that where once people came for the pure enjoyment of the challenge, he says today many are driven by personal gain, often with a reckless disregard of the very real dangers the mountain poses. I sometimes wonder now whether people come to really come to climb Everest as themselves, or they come just to be a hero of some sort. This year, the most daring strides are being made by another Nepalese Canadian. 32-year-old Sudarshan Gautam lost both his arms as a teenager when his kite hit high voltage lines. With the help of extra Sherpas using ropes to balance him, he's determined to reach the top. While having only ever trained on much smaller mountains, he says he's ready. For my daily life too, I'm climbing so many so many meters high the mountain, you know. Okay. <laughs> when I wake up, until sleep, I have to face so many things, like eating, uh, driving. A year ago, Gotham sold his restaurant and is spending $100,000 on this venture, gambling that Everest will help him launch a political career in Canada. I didn't go to Canada just to earn the money, you know. I... I went to Canada to do something good for the Nepalese community. I want to do something good through the politics, through the business. In Gautam's camp, we also meet Min Bahadur Sirchan. In 2008, at age 76, the Nepalese climber became the oldest man to reach the peak. Now at 81, he's come back again. His main competitor for the title, he tells us, has returned to the mountain. Suffering from stomach troubles, Sertan asks to be excused. He appears frail, his steps uncertain leading one to wonder whether he will be strong enough. His rival appears much more capable. Yuichiro Mura has summited Everest twice before. Now at 80, he hopes to seize the title from Sir Chand. We meet him after his training run. Considered an Everest veteran, in 1970, Mura became a legend when he skied down one side. But that was a long time ago. Mr. Mira, what yeah. do you say to people who might call you crazy for doing this? Oh, crazy. It's, uh, oh, many people have the average thinking. Crazy maker we, through the, our limit. So crazy pushes you past the human limit. Yes. It's a good thing <laughs> yeah. then. But here too, one begins to worry whether Mira may be stretching his limit. Four months ago, he had open heart surgery, his fourth. Still, he argues, he's better than ever. If man get the healthy and spirit to be challenged, so age is no problem. As we prepare to leave, forecasters tell us the upcoming days will likely bring the best weather Everest has seen in decades. Waves are expected to summit. One only wonders if their success will only spur on more adventure seekers, eager to test themselves against a temperamental goddess known for her beauty and harshness.